Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines we have for you. The dark side of central bank digital currencies, but the XRP ledger in hooks, baby. We got Twitter in payments. And how about this? Could the XRP buyback become the Shane Ellis theory? <laughs> Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check this out. We're at $1.08 trillion market cap for crypto. We're off by 1.8% today. Good afternoon. Bitcoin, 23,100 plus. Ethereum, almost 1,600 bucks. Tether market cap, 67.8 billion right now. And XRP, 40 cents. Now, let's take a look at this. I want to show you something. I don't know if you've all been following. I use the chat GPT uh, artificial intelligence platform. I've been using it on my own, looking at it. It is fascinating. It is really fascinating and creepy all in one shot. But nevertheless, it is where the world is going. And you know what? Samba Nova right here is a leader in artificial intelligence. Very similar to the same thing you, you see with chat GPT. It's on link to. Are you kidding me? And as a leader in AI, Forbes is saying it's going to be more than a $1 trillion market in just by 2029. Unbelievable. Link to cutting edge, baby. PolySign, Ripple, Uphold, Link to itself. So many other great products. And now AI too. Click the link of a sponsor underneath the video. Do not mess around. Take a listen to this. If you wonder where the money's going to go, listen to Grant Cardone's brother, Gary Cardone, talk right here. And shout out to the Wolf of All Streets. Take a listen. Shout out to Riz for the clip. The crypto world, because the payment industry has a massive amount of problems in declining. He immediately goes crypto world to the payment industry. Hmm. I wonder which digital asset has been highly laser focused on that exact use case and pain point. Credit card transactions and having your credit card decline just because the guy, the use, the, the uh, provider of that card may not like you anymore. That happened in Russia one year ago. All Visa, all MasterCard, you're not using any of this. So the sovereign value to me as a bit of a preacher who doesn't like being controlled by uh, people I don't even know their name. I didn't vote for them. I like crypto because at least for a small percentage, 3%, 5%, 10%, I, I have some sovereign. I've, I've managed a bit of my sovereign risk, right? Like, hmm, I just want to leave the country now. And I'm going to go live on a sailboat. And I'm not going to be tied to a currency or a passport uh, that makes me do certain things. So that's kind of how I ended up here. I find it intellectually, it is the most exciting industry I have ever been in. I couldn't agree with him more, and he makes some very valid points. And you're going to see some information here that really just kind of opens the door to this whole conversation. But there's a dark side to it all, right? Today, we have to touch on this and shout out to Jeremy Hogan for this post here. He reminds us that attorney John Deaton is attending the actual hearing for the library case today. It is the remedies hearing under the SEC and library case. We will keep you posted what comes from that, but it is important to understand all of the outcome and ruling and decisions made in that case. Um, it is the First Circuit Court, so it's not the Second Circuit Court where Ripple's case is. But nevertheless, everything happening that affects the state of cryptocurrency is a very big deal. And shout out to those gentlemen. This, <laughs> this is the president of Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Let's just hear him say it. Because I'm pretty skeptical. I keep I'm pretty skeptical, too. But when it comes to digital money and central bank digital currencies, none other than the president of the Federal Reserve Bank to tell you what he's so skeptical about. I'm pretty skeptical. I keep asking anybody, anybody at the Fed or outside of the Fed to explain to me what problem this is solving. A digital, I can send anybody in this room five dollars with Venmo right now. <laughs> right. No, seriously. So what is it that a CBDC could do that Venmo can't do? And all I get is a bunch of hand-waving. I get a bunch, well, maybe it's better for financial inclusion. 
maybe it's better for cross-border remittances. Maybe. Is there any evidence that it is? And, you know, they say, well, what about China? China is doing it. Well, I can see why China would do it. If they want to monitor every one of your transactions, you could do that with the central bank digital currency. You can't do that with Venmo. If you want to impose negative interest rates, you could do that with the central bank digital currency. You can't do that with Venmo. And if you want to directly tax customer accounts, you could do that with the central bank digital currency. You can't do that with Venmo. So I get why China would be interested. Why would the American people be for that? Because I'm pretty skeptical. I keep asking anybody, anybody at the Fed or outside of the Fed to explain okay, to me what there problem it is. Here's what I want to say to that. First of all, great questions. We know why China want to do it because they control their people like crazy, right? But why would anybody at the Fed or inside the U.S. government want to do it? I'll give you my answer. Because it helps insulate the unraveling and the controlled demolition that we're watching of the global reserve currency as the petrodollar status. It is no longer up for debate whether it will happen. It is beginning to happen. The elevated status that the U.S. dollar receives as a global reserve currency and as the petrodollar is being unwound as we speak. Now, I believe that will happen over years and you will see other assets rise up to try to sit beside it and compete with it because in years past, that is how that has happened. And I would expect it to move back to that kind of approach too. But if you think of it from that point of view, I certainly don't want to see the central bank digital currency controlled and directly to the dollar. I think that's why you could have a third party example, USD coin, and that is not something the government could just simply turn off on you. Now, some things would need to happen, I'm sure, to help further to insulate the, us as consumers and citizens as the use of that. But that would put that dollar, digital or otherwise, in high demand, I believe, around the world, because you know it is a private digital dollar. But coming back to the back end, the wholesale side, where's the problem at? Why would you need to do that? Well, you could send Venmo. You could send PayPal to the point that the president of the Minneapolis Fed was making. Well, let me tell you what you can't do. Because the Venmo and the PayPals of the world can't insulate you from the unraveling of the petrodollar. Now, can it? No, it cannot. But XRP is a bridge currency, can. Ridiculous. It's the goal. That's the goal. That is the goal to become a bridge currency, a complement to the system, an insulator even, not just a complement. Then there's this. Talk about more dark side. I don't know what scares me more, that there's a dark side to central bank digital currencies or that you can find somebody who's excited to share it with you. CBDC development, is there a vision yeah. to have everyone using uh, retail CBDCs in China. Yeah, I've, I've watched this a little bit. I've seen some of the pilots and my friends have participated in some of the experiences. Um, I think that there is kind of two challenges for CBDCs that the government's thinking through. One is how do you actually create new use cases for CBDCs as opposed to fighting kind of against WeChat and Alipay for market mm -hmm. share? Right, because CBC originally was designed to be kind of a backbone infrastructure. If one of these two companies actually running 50% of the electronic payments in China had a problem, the China would, their country would not go into sort of a state of paralysis because they couldn't be able to pay anything anymore. So I think that was kind of one of the ideas of CBDCs in the first place for retail use. Listen, but yeah. the other exciting idea actually is the use of CBDCs to incentivize green action. Uh, which is if you were to do certain things in Shanghai or Shenzhen, you actually can earn CBDCs for your sustainable efforts. And that's actually a very interesting way to use CBDCs because it involves smart contracts, involves being able to monitor and send you something directly to your wallet. It involves also being able to sort of change and tweak kind of your behavior, especially from a consumption perspective. And that should scare the hell out of all of us. I don't know why the hell he's so excited about it. <laughs> But here we see the expansion coming to Japan when it comes to stable coins. Again, kind of leaning into the idea notion that there would be a retail digital dollar or dollars available, stable coins, if you will. 
Starting in June, Japanese exchanges will be able to apply a special license to trade stablecoins. This can make it possible for overseas stablecoins like Tether and USD coin to enter the Japanese market. But does that mean it does not mean that it will be easy? It says here the dollars that would back the stablecoins circulating the Japanese exchanges will likely require a scheme in which the underlying assets are held in a trust at a Japanese trust bank. Well, there you have that. I want to see it. Show me the baby. Show me the reserves. I don't see that being too awful. And then here we have right here. Talk about making that integration, that crossing over, that coexisting phase, the introduction of new technology. Elon Musk is obviously applied for payment licensure for Twitter's platform. And now it says Twitter payment is going to use fiat, but crypto can be implemented later on, says Elon. And I think that makes the most sense. Get the fiat hooked up and it'd be very easy to introduce the crypto assets and digital assets. Then you could make a market very simply for. And think of the amount of liquidity that could be organized immediately by doing such a thing. Pretty remarkable. Then we have this right here from Coindesk. New crypto laws are likely coming in the U.S. whether the industry likes it or not. Says wonders if Congress is separate custody from exchanges. Again, I have said what we're talking about here is mirroring the conventional market, the traditional market structure, which I have been pounding the ground about since we've had a channel. This right here is the question bringing up the idea of separating the exchanges from custody in order to have no more FTX collapses, commingling of funds, and those things. I believe that, look, outside of the conversation of decentralization, which obviously is another whole ball of wax but i believe with decentralization the way you get around that is you take the christian carlo approach and brian brooks approach and you have reg tech regulatory technology nodes on the approved adopted networks value protocols and they can monitor the activities for suspicion all of the entities should be registered and just like in the banking system kyc aml Hey, and if you want to float around on some network that doesn't have any of that, and that's the equivalent of working on the dark web, you get where this is going? Because I believe that this is where that is going. But it is a phase-in approach, whether we're talking about inside of Ripple and the different products they had back in the day, X Current, X Via, X Rapid, combined eventually and brought into one housing unit, which became RippleNet and on-demand liquidity and Ripple Liquidity Hub. That's how they lay it out. They've grown into these things, phased into these operations. I believe the same thing is taking place on a much more macro level. The Federal Reserve readying Fed now for payments. We know that Ripple is a partner working with the U.S. Faster Payments Council. We know that Ripple is also working with the U.S. Digital Dollar Project in a technical sandbox for central bank digital currencies. I mean, what are we to make of it? And by the way, look at what's happening here. We'd say when says we're actually going to do this with Hook's amendment being audited by security experts. There will be a federated side chain with Hook's existing for the XRP ledger ecosystem to test it out with real XRP. Hooks provide a variety of use cases to the XRP ledger from finance to key management. Shout out to We'd Say When, we'd say when and the entire XRP Ledger Labs team. Are you kidding me? Then there's this idea. Let's ask this question right here. Because we know that there has been a buyback of Ripple shares, right? Remember when Ripple bought back from Tetragon and they bought the shares back at a higher valuation and brought the company from a $10 billion valuation to a $15 billion valuation? I've gone over extensively here about how Ripple has announced in their own quarterly reports going all the way back to 2019, 
As it has been the case since Q4 2019, Ripple did not conduct programmatic sales in Q4 of 2022. Basically saying we have not sold to the secondary exchanges unless they're ODL partners. Also saying in the same report, Ripple has been a buyer of XRP in the secondary market, which is the retail market, and expects to continue to undertake the purchase in the future at market price as on-demand liquidity continues to gain global momentum. Because they know that XRP is cheaper now than it ever will be in the future, and the best thing to do is to try to slowly buy it back off the market before the rest of the industries and markets participants and makers who understand what the, or will come to understand the benefits of XRP realize it. Because once they do, I think you set the stage for a possible Shane Ellis theory. And I believe that they could also play a key role here is the ruling in the SEC versus Ripple. If the ruling is to come out in such a way that let's just say that sales are prohibited on secondary market, that may not be the case, but if it is, then I would expect this to go very, very quickly because you're going to see it come out of our hands. So there has to be some kind of arbitrage moment on the, uh, on the exchanges, getting it off the exchanges, 30, 60 days, 90 days, whatever it is to clean the exchanges out. It may take just a matter of hours, if not days to do it. And what would the price of XRP be then? Not financial advice for me or anyone else. It's just my digital perspectives. Boy, are we getting close. I'll catch all of you on the next one.